All right, so in, uh, on March 27th in 1964, in Queens, New York, 37 respectable law-abiding citizens watched a killer stalk and stab a woman. Twice the killer was scared off by voices and lights, but no one called the police during the attack. And so the killer returned and fatally stabbed the woman, and the only, there was only one person to call the police after this incident happened. And then this uh, assistant chief inspector, Frederick Lawson, had 25 years of homicide investigation experience. He was shocked by this Kew Garden murder, not because of the crime itself, but because no one cared to call the police during the attack. So just think about it, 37 respectable law-abiding citizens watch a man stalk and murder a woman. The New York Times describes this Kew Garden as a good neighborhood with few crimes reported. Actually, the only crimes that were reported would be kids playing too loud outside and garbage cans being kicked over. And so as the police were looking for reports, they asked a person who witnessed the entire thing and asked him, why didn't he do anything? He says, I didn't want to get involved. This man saw what happened, called his friend from another county to ask what he should do, then walks to another apartment building to tell that person to call the cops. Most witnesses told the police that they were afraid to call the police. And then when they were asked why, they, the police report said that they had meaningless answers. This situation led to an important psychological study uh, of human behavior. Two young psychologists studied why people do not help in emergencies. Their study showed that the more witnesses, the less likely anyone will call for help. And main reason is everybody thinks that someone else is going to take action. And so this is known as the bystander effect. The bystander effect means that individuals are less likely to help when others are present. And it might be hard for you to believe that people could just stand by during such a tragic event. But the truth is we as a church often do the same thing. We watch our enemies attack our world The world, the flesh, and the devil attack us every single day. And what we do is sit back and we don't help. We might raise a voice and even shine a light on an issue, but we don't actually run for help or call for help. And the church needs to wake up because people around us are in desperate need of hope. And they're in need of the hope of the gospel. Because if we don't, we will end up looking like the people from the story who watch somebody die from the comfort of their home. Similarly, we sit in our church seats, sitting, uh, seeing the world suffering around us, but don't do anything about it. And we can no longer sit back and watch our enemies attack our world. And so you might be confused on what are you talking about? How do you see our enemies today attack the world? And it's uh, so many different ways. We might, and we also are confused on how the enemy attacks. We think that the devil is hiding behind every rock, but actually the way he operates is subtle and very quietly behind the scenes. And so let's take a closer look on how the world, the flesh, and the devil are attacking us. The world, the world promotes things that conflict with Christian teachings. The world exerts opinions that go against biblical principles. The world uses media to influence people away from Jesus. And if it does not point you to Jesus, that means it's pointing you away from Jesus. There are no things that are just in the middle. The flesh plays a role in this struggle. The flesh tempts us with self-indulgence and sinful desires. It causes internal struggles, making us question Jesus and his design for us. And the flesh promotes instant gratification. The devil actively works against us. The devil attacks church leadership. It sows seeds of doubt. It causes division and gossip. Where gossip is, the devil and his demons are close by. Jim Cimbala said, gossip is the number one church killer. And so the devil spreads false teaching called this thing called progressive Christianity. And so the world, the flesh, and the devil are actively attacking the people around us. And these attacks are not new. They were present in 
uh, the, in, in Paul's age, when he wrote this letter to the Colossians, false teaching and philosophies, ideas that contradict Christian teaching, legalism and asceticism, worship of angels and spiritual be- beings. There was also a blend of Christian beliefs with Jewish and Gentile practices diluting the purity of Christian teaching. There was this thing called Gnosticism, was heresy, teaching that humans can transcend evil through uh, strength and knowledge. And then there was disunity and division. And Paul was struggling with the same things that we are struggling with. And he actually is trying to teach us on how to combat these attacks. Throughout the entire letter of Colossians, he shows us and teaches us that the way to do this is to teach the supremacy of Christ, that Christ is supreme over all creation, has all authority and power, that Christ is sufficient for all of our needs, providing salvation, strength, and guidance. He taught us that the importance of being rooted in Christ, also that the need for followers of Jesus to be grounded and not swayed by false teachings. And then at the end of the letter, the things that we're going to talk about today, he gives us practical steps on how to fight the darkness. And so if you have your Bibles open, you can turn to Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, because he outlines specifics, attack, actions that we can take to stand firm in our face and resist the the attacks of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so he, he writes, continue steadfastly in prayer. Be watchful in it with thanksgiving. So if we want to fight against the darkness, we need to be people who pray. We need to pray. And Paul gives us a formula for prayer. Prayer is meant to be continual. The word continue emphasizes that prayer is something Christians are expected to do and continue to do. So if you've ever read the Gospels, you'll see that in Matthew 5, Jesus said, when you pray, in Luke 11, he said again, when you pray, say this, Mark 11, 25, and when you pray, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, Ephesians 6, 18, and pray in the Spirit in all occasions. Prayer is expected. And prayer is a big part of the Christian life. Charles Spurgeon once said this when he was asked, Um, what is more important, prayer or Bible reading? And he asked, what is more important, breathing in or breathing out? Prayer is important, but why is it important? Christians always tell you that you need to pray, but I don't think we do a good job on telling you why. Why is prayer important? The first thing is prayer is communication. Prayer is talking to God. Have you ever tried to have a relationship without talking to the person? It's impossible. I've been married for a little over two years now. And if the days that I don't talk to my wife, that means that we're not having a good relationship that day, right? Because we need to constantly talk to each other. Married people, can you help me out, right? You ever try not to talk to the person you're married to? It doesn't work out because prayer is communication. How are you going to have a relationship with God if you never talk to him? Prayer is communication. Also, prayer molds and transforms our lives. Prayer takes us into the presence of God. And so being with God is where we become more like him. When you sit at his feet and you just hang out with him and talk to him, he makes you more and more like Jesus because prayer aligns our will with God's will because prayer is ultimately surrender. When you pray, you're saying, God, you're God and I'm not. And so prayer is surrender. Prayer is not about bending God's will to ours, but uh, about aligning our wills to God. But here's the problem. Two reasons. The first reason is we just we don't pray because we don't feel like it. We don't pray because we don't feel like Donald Whitney in one of his books. He says, since prayer is talking with God, why don't people pray more? Why don't the people of God enjoy praying more? I maintain that truly born again, genuinely, genuinely. Christian people often do not pray simply because they do not feel like it. And the reason they don't feel like praying is that when they do pray, they tend to say the same old things about the same old things. When you said the same old things about the same old things about a thousand times, how do you feel about saying them again? And so he's trying to tell us that we are not, we're, we, we don't pray because we don't feel like it. And we don't pray because we often we, we let our emotions lead us and we cannot allow that to happen. Prayer cannot be based on feeling. One of the most common lies we often buy into is the notion, notion that we have to feel a particular way in order to pray, that we must feel motivated, inspired, energetic, or generally in good spirits to pray. And that is a lie. We need to pray at all times, never ceasing. We must not s- stop allowing our inconsistent feelings to dictate our 
actions. And so we must pray because of two things. Jesus told us to, and also it's good for us. Do you know that prayer is good for you? That when you spend time with God, when you go into his presence, he allows you just to to feel something different that the world cannot offer you. We just sang a song that everywhere else you go could not fill you. That where you get completion is with God. And so when you go hang out with him, when you go spend time with him, it's actually good for your mind, body, and spirit. That it's good for you. And so prayer is something that we do because we know it's good for us. I'm diabetic and I love carbs, all right, which is a terrible combination, okay? If you eat carbs as a diabetic, it turns into sugar and it makes your sugar, you know, rise and then your wife gets mad at you and this is whole scene, okay? But it doesn't matter if I don't feel like eating healthy. I have to eat healthy because if not, later down the road, my kidneys can fail, uh, I can lose sight, blindness, uh, diabetes is a leading cause of blindness. There's so many different things that happen, but I cannot base my entire diet on feeling. And the same goes with prayer. Who cares if you don't feel like it? Talk to God because it's good for you. Prayer is good not just for you, but everyone around you because a real Christian, a faithful Christian prays for the people they love and prays for the people who don't like them. So prayer works for you and it works for others. And then the second reason we don't pray is because we don't know how. Think about it. Who who actually sat you down and taught you, said, hey, this is how you should pray. Let me walk you through it. This is how you call upon heaven. This is how you call upon the name of the Lord. See, we think prayer is complicated. That's why some of us, when we get called upon to pray in church, you get really sweaty and confused. Like, I don't know if I want to do it. It's because we think we need the right words, but in all honesty, you're just talking to your Father in heaven. And so we don't pray because we think it's complicated and we've never been taught how. So what is prayer? A simple definition is talking to God. There was a book called The Theology on Prayer, and they said that it's calling upon the name of the Lord. I love the way Tim Keller put it. He said that prayer is continuing the conversation that God has already started, that God called you first. It's not you calling God, but that he, you're just continuing the conversation that he already started. And so one of the best ways or forms of prayer that I have learned, and if you're taking notes, this is a great thing to write down. I'm going to try to teach you what I, I mean, what I think is one of the easiest ways to pray. And it's taking the word prayer and using it as an acronym. So it's P-R-A-Y. And so the first thing, if you want to learn how to pray is you pause. That's the P. And one of the passages that I love to use is Isaiah 6. Isaiah is walking into the throne room of God and he's seeing God seated on his throne and these angels are circling him and they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That the whole earth is filled with your glory. And so when I pray, I just pause and I try to picture that. I try to picture his robe filling the temple. And they said that they were singing and it shook the foundations of the ground. And so you just take a second and you just pause before you rush in with any of your requests, with any of the things that you want him to do. And you just understand that the earth is his footstool, that he created everything in our world. And so after you've taken a second to pause, you then rejoice. That's the R. You thank him for everything that he has done. The fact that he has saved you from sin, death, and hell, that he sent his one and only son to take your place on the cross that he loved you while you were enemies. And you just thank him. You thank him for waking you up, for the family that he has given you. You ate a good meal last night, thank him for that. It's so crazy that we think that if we're having a bad day that we don't have anything to be thankful for. But even if God did not give you another thing, you can still be thankful. And so you pause and then you rejoice and then you ask, that's the A. You just ask him for whatever you want whatever is going on. And right now I've been asking them, my grandma's in the hospital. Well, she's in hospice now. And I've been asking them just to be with my family. He says, the Holy Spirit's the comforter. Comfort us. My grandma's like my mom, you know? And so just asking, man, the tension in that household of so many people coming to visit my grandma, hearing the news that, man, she has days, maybe hours to live just asking God, be with us. 
Talk to us. Encourage us. Help me encourage my family. You know, and that, and then you step into that. And then at the end, the why is just yield, surrender, just like Jesus did. Your will be done, not mine. Hey, God, I'm leaving this at your feet. Do whatever you would like. If you want to give us a portion of heaven today, then God be the glory. But if you decide to do whatever you want to do, then God be the glory. And we just yield. So that's how I pray. And now you know how to pray. So you have no excuse on how to pray. You pause, rejoice, ask, and yield. And then Pete Gregg in his book, um, How to Pray, he said this. He said, keep it simple, keep it real, and keep it up. Keep it simple, keep it real, and keep it up, which leads me to my next point. Paul tells us this about prayer. He says, prayer is steadfast. Another way to say it, prayer is loyal, it's faithful, it's committed, it's devoted, it's dedicated. We are called to be people who are faithful in prayer. And faithfulness is a choice. Guess what happens? If you don't choose to pray, guess what would happen? You're not gonna pray. If you don't choose to spend time with God, you're not gonna spend time with God. Simply put, if you do not want to invest in your relationship with God, you will not have one. You will not have one. Think about it like this. What are the best relationships in your life right now? Friends, family, coworkers. It's an easy answer. The best relationships you have are the ones you invest in. And so you have to think of prayer as investing in your relationship with God. You have to go and understand that you spending time with God is you investing in your relationship with him. And if nothing changes, nothing changes. You can say all you want, that you want to pray, you want to be better at it. But if you don't step up and actually start praying, actually start going into the throne room of God, it's not going to change anything. So this is what we need to do. We need to schedule our prayers. When I was a young Christian, I actually asked my, one of my pastor friends, and I was like, hey, man, it's really a struggle to pray. What do I need to do? He says, put it on your calendar until you don't have to anymore. And so at, for a while, at 2.42, I would pray every single day. And it was because of Acts 2.42 and the apostles, they devoted themselves to breaking the bread and teaching and, and, and to prayer. And so at 2.42, I scheduled an alarm and I prayed every single day. So that's what you might need to do. If you want to be better at prayer, you might just need to schedule it. Put it on your calendar. And then a lot of you might be saying, I don't have a lot of time, Carlos. I'm so busy. Well, I don't care. Just bring to God whatever you got. I'm not going to give you a time, like say, hey, you got to pray for an hour or two hours or whatever. If you have five minutes, start with five minutes. If you got a minute, start with a minute. And I love the fact that there were so, so many stories in the gospel of Jesus taking what people had and multiplying it, right? So Matthew 14, 13 through 21, it says the disciples only had five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus said, bring them here. And what he did, he multiplied the bread and fish. This is a crazy thing that happened. He didn't get mad at what they had. He didn't get frustrated at them. He just said, bring, them, bring it here. And the same goes with your prayers. Just think about it. What, would, what if you brought to Jesus all the time you had? Do you not think he could multiply your minute, your five minutes, your 10 minutes? What could Jesus really do with your five minutes? What do you think God could do with just being able to multiply that in your life? And like I said, I've seen that in my life. When I was young, it was really hard to pray. I would read the books and I would hear about these guys praying for hours. And I was like, something's wrong with me because I can't do that. And then it hit me. I just need to bring God what I have and he'll multiply the time. And so as I prayed more, it got easier. I brought in my one minute. He turned it to five minutes. That five minutes turned to 30 minutes. That 30 minutes turned to an hour. Now, sometimes I feel like, man, I got so much to say. Uh, I got to stay a little bit longer. It's because God is teaching me how to talk to him. And he's going to, and, and as I read his word, he's giving me more things to say. And as I witness the world around me, I have more things to pray for because that's how we fight as Christians. We pray for a broken world. And so bring to God and allow him to multiply it. And so this is, this is how you cultivate a prayer life. You go to God, you talk to him as much as you can, as often as you can, for as long as you can. And this will produce in you a watchful and thankful heart, which is the next thing Paul teaches us about prayer. He says, prayer is watchful. Watchful. We are constantly watching the world around us. 
and we're watching with a purpose. And you got to understand this. We do not watch to criticize the world. We watch to pray for the world. This is a struggle in the church because if you've seen the news, if you have social media, man, we sometimes the church is the first people to show up on those feeds about criticizing things and their words are so sharp. And so if you have social media or if you've seen the news, you know that our world is in shambles. And so I got a couple of stats that I just wanted to share. So let's just look at teenagers for a second. 42% of high school students report feeling sad or hopeless almost every day. That's close to 50%. 20% of teens have experienced depression. 15% of teens have experienced a major depressive episode. Girls are twice as likely as boys to have clinical depression. That's just kids. What about adults? As, February, as of February 2023, 29% of U.S. adults have been diagnosed with depression at some point of their lifetime. A percentage of Americans currently have, having or being treated for depression has risen 17.8% since 2015. A survey from April 30th to May 27, 2024, found that 14% of U.S. adults reported symptoms of depressive disorder. And then young adults, 18 to 29, have the highest rate of current depression or treatment for depression at 24.6%. That's one of every four. One of every four. The National Institute of Mental Health reports that 21 million U.S. adults had at least one major depressive episode in 2021 representing 8.3 of all U.S. adults. That's one out of every 10, one out of every 10. And I bring this up is because I see it, don't you? Like people look sad. They look lost. They look depressed. And so I know that we could criticize them. We could say they're sad because they don't know Jesus they don't want to go to church. They've disowned God. They don't want anything to do with him. They've made bad choices. We could do that because we're, we're great at criticizing, but our criticism will not help them. Our criticism will not bring them hope. And so what if instead of criticizing people, we actually started to pray for them? That when that person cuts us off on the highway, or that person gave you an attitude at the restaurant, instead of criticizing them and whatever they believe, that you actually started to pray for them. God, would you help them? God, would you show them the way home? God, would you put people in their lives who can encourage them in the way they should live? God, would you allow them to experience the grace and mercy and love of Jesus? God, would you wake them up to the gospel? Because we need to understand this. A hurting world should push us to pray, not to criticize not to criticize, because this is the truth. We have gotten great at criticizing people, and we have gotten terrible at praying for them. And the enemy loves it. The devil loves it. He applauds us. Samuel Chadwick once said this, Satan dreads nothing but prayer. His one concern is to keep the saints from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless study, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil. He mocks at our wisdom, and he tr but he trembles. He trembles when we pray. The devil hates it when God's church prays. And he will do the best he can to distract us from praying. Distraction is one of the devil's greatest weapons because he knows this. He knows that our time is limited. He knows we don't have forever. So he wants us to worry more about the material world than the spiritual world. He wants you to forget that we're in a war. Ephesians 6, 12 states that our fight is not flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual voices of evil in the heavenly places. Charles Spurgeon said it like this, consider how precious a soul must be when both God and the devil are after it. That both God and the devil are after it. And did you know that the best way to fight for people is to pray for them? The best way to fight against the darkness is to pray. The best way to fight against your enemies is to pray. And so my question to you is, how have you been fighting lately? Have you been praying for your friends, coworkers, family, spouse, or have you been criticizing them behind their back, talking about them? We are watchful so that we can pray for the world around us. 
And we cannot allow the devil to distract us from the great work of prayer. Oswald Chambers put it this way. He says, prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. And we cannot be distracted. We cannot be distracted. And so Paul continues to teach us. He says, this is how you fight against the distractions. He says, Paul says, pray with thanksgiving. Pray with thanksgiving. So if you don't want to get distracted, have a thankful heart. Because we have been forgiven much unless you have forgotten of what Christ has done for you. That even if God did not do another thing for you, you still have a lot to be thankful for. That you have been given a gift you did not deserve. You did not deserve. That because of Jesus, we have eternal life. We have access to God. We have freedom from sin. And we have been saved from sin, death, and hell. Thanksgiving is a way we fight against the enemy's lies. To be thankful, uh, we have to remember what Jesus has done for you. And you've probably heard it before, that you need to preach the gospel to yourself. That every single day that you remind yourself of what Jesus has done, you are practicing thanksgiving. And so preaching the gospel to yourself means that you need to know the gospel and knowing the gospel will produce thanksgiving in us. And if it doesn't, something's wrong. OK, you need to talk to somebody if it doesn't work. Because that should that should calm your heart. It should change your mind, because if you think about it, a perfect, sinless, all powerful, all knowing God left heaven. He lived the life you could not live. He took the punishment you deserve. He died the death that you should have died. And he did this all while you were enemies. You were sinners far from him. He did this because he loved you. And so that we can have life. And if you could just repeat that every single day to yourself, that would make you a lot more grateful and thankful as you pray and as you talk to God, if you preach the gospel to yourself. So if you want to know the gospel, guess what you need to do? Pretty simple. You need to read the what? It doesn't sound like y'all reading it. Y'all need to read the what? (laughs) The Bible. You got to read the Bible. Spend time in the pages of this book every single day. That's why Paul says in Colossians 1, 9 through 10, he says, ask God to give them complete knowledge of his will, spiritual wisdom, and understanding. The NLT translation puts it this way. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. If you want to know God, you got to get to know Jesus. Colossians 1.15 says, Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1.3 says, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. So as you get to know Jesus, you get to know God. And as you grow in your relationship with Jesus, it will shape how you live in the world. In fact, deepening our relationship with Jesus will shape how we pray. And that's why Paul leads us to verses three and four. It says, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. So our relationship with Jesus will push us to pray for opportunity, but not just any opportunity, opportunity to share the gospel. Paul uses an image of an open door for the word. So Paul is praying for an invitation, an opportunity, a door to run through. And what does that look like for us in our lives? First, we need to make sure that we are praying for these opportunities every single day. There are opportunities for you to share the gospel every single day, but right now you're just not aware of it. You're not looking for it. And so Paul's saying, pray that we don't miss these opportunities. One thing that we do when we have our young adult gathering at, at Crosspoint is I tell my leaders that we're not going to get a Tuesday back. That some of the people coming in to our auditorium and they're going to sit in our seats, they might not ever show back up. And so we cannot take a Tuesday for granted. If people walk in through our doors, we need to make sure that they know that they're loved, that they hear the gospel, that they have as less distractions as possible because we might not get another shot. And so we're praying that we can see these opportunities. And so so the first thing is you gotta pray for these opportunities every day. And then the second is we need to know what an open door looks like. When I was a youth pastor, I served as a youth pastor for like 10 years and we would take kids on mission trips all the time. 
And one of the things that we would make sure that they understood is that we're going overseas to share the gospel. We might plant trees, we might paint houses, and we might dig wells. But our main job is to share the gospel. So I would train our students to look for opportunities to do that. And so first, they needed to know the gospel. So I made sure that they understood the gospel. They read it for themselves, all those good things. And then when we got to Haiti or Dominican Republic or wherever we were going, we then tried to make sure that they knew how to tie everything back to the gospel. So we would go door to door asking people if they knew how to clean their water or if they needed fruit trees. And then when we got to sit down with them, We would show them how to filter their water. And then after that, we would say, hey, do you want to know where their living water is? Right. John four, we can point them back to it. And then when we said, hey, this tree is going to go old, but I can tell you how to be connected to the true vine. Right. And so we would just show them connections, how to share the gospel, because we were there to share the gospel. We might plant trees, paint houses and dig wells, but we're there to share the gospel. And so everything we do is a platform for the gospel. And you might be saying that's easy on a mission trip. Well, I also used to Uber for a long time. Before I, uh, before I got engaged, I needed to save some money. So ministry, you don't make a lot of, uh, a lot of dough. So we got to figure out other ways, side hustles. And I wanted to buy a ring for my, for my, my girlfriend at the time who became my fiance, who's now my wife. And uh, I started Ubering and I started to save money. And I can tell you that most of my conversations in my Ubers, Literally, I would say 80 to 90 percent always let or ended with Jesus. And the things that I would do, I would just talk to him. I would ask him questions. I would really want to know about their life. And there was a specific story I wanted to share was with this college kid. I picked him up in Marietta and I was taking him to Kennesaw. And I start my Ubers like I I regularly do. I say, hey, what's up? How's it going? And he'll tell me, oh, good. And, you know, I'm in college. I ask him what what school he's going to KSU. I say, what are you studying? He told me what he's studying. And I was like, oh, why do you want to do that? He kept talking to me. He's like, well, I don't really know what I want to do. I'm kind of confused. I was really, why are you confused? And you can tell where we're going with this. And he said, well, I don't really know if this is a study I want to do. I feel like I should be doing this. And I was like, And he just kept talking to me, kept sharing about all these things. And then he just said, I really don't know what to pick because I've been really sad. I was like, why are you really sad? And he continued. He said, "I, I just feel like I'm lost. I feel like I'm just going because I've been told to do this. I feel like I have no purpose in life. And, I, and he just kept going. And then by the time we got to his apartment building, he is crying in my car. And all I've done is ask questions. And then I got to tell him, hey, man, when I was late in my, teen, in, in my late teens, I was in the same boat. I was confused. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know how to handle things. And then I told him, but then I found Jesus. And he gave me hope. And he gave me a purpose. And I said, he could do the same for you. I don't know specifically what your field of study is going to be. I don't know when you're going to graduate. I don't know the job you're going to get. But I know that you can find your identity in Jesus and that he can give you purpose. And so all I did was I was looking for an open door. And what I did was then to declare the mystery of Christ. And that's what Paul asked for us to pray for. He said, pray that we have an open door to declare the mysteries of Christ, to share the hope that we have, to share the gospel, to share where we find true meaning and purpose. And by the end of my trip, I told him that I was in the same uh, dilemma. When I was young, I didn't know where I was going. But when I found Jesus, I found purpose, meaning, and direction. And before he left my car, I got to pray for him. And he thanked me in tears and got out of my car. I've never seen him ever again. But now I know that he knows the hope of the gospel and that the Holy Spirit is going to do a work in him. And so we are praying for these opportunities. And so here's my question for you. Do you have friends who are lost? Do you have friends who are struggling, who are hurting, who are grieving, who are depressed, who are struggling in their relationships, who are addicted, who are seeking meaning in life? What you need to do is point them to Jesus. Do you have friends who are lonely, facing difficult decisions, dealing with guilt and shame, seeking forgiveness and reconciliation, experience the traumatic event, the pressures of the career getting to them? Do they feel burnt out and exhausted, seeking direction and purpose? You have an opportunity to point them to Jesus, because this is the truth. Jesus is the answer everyone is looking for. They just don't know it yet. It's the answer everyone is looking for. And so all we have to do is share the hope that we have as believers. And this is why you need to know the gospel for yourself. That means you need to study it. 
Um, I don't know what book said it, but they said it better than I did. And it says, we never graduate from the gospel because we never outgrow the gospel. And then John Piper said it like this. You never outgrow your need for the gospel. You never graduate to a course where the gospel should not be the center of the curriculum. There is no post-gospel graduate school in the Christian life. The center of every ongoing growth in the knowledge has Christ crucified, risen, received by faith alone, like a little child at the center of the curriculum. So the gospel is the center of everything we do. And we need the gospel and we need to be people who share the gospel every chance we get, no matter our circumstances. For example, Paul is literally in prison and he's praying for opportunity. And this means that, this is what I mean, that no matter your circumstances, no matter what's going on in life, you need to pray for opportunity. Because think about it, this is a bad day. I don't know who, how many people have been in prison, but that would ruin you, my day at least. You might be tougher than me, but if I was in prison, I don't know if that, that's the first thing I'll be praying for. And what Paul's trying to teach is it, it doesn't matter how your day is going. You're still on a mission. So I don't know how many of us have been in prison, but I feel like it would ruin most of our days. But here's the point. Don't allow your circumstances to hinder your mission. When we have a bad day, the mission can't stop. When others hurt us, the mission can't stop. And I'm preaching to myself, preaching to myself. When others hurt you, the mission can't stop. If you're having a bad day, the mission can't stop because you are a follower of Jesus and you are on mission for Jesus. And it's called the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You are called to make disciples of all nations all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to teach them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded them. That means that we are all in full-time ministry, that we believe our God is a sending God. He sent his son to save us and his spirit to empower us, and he now sends us into the world to carry out his mission. And this means the work of full-time ministry is not reserved for a few paid professionals, but for every follower of Jesus. We have been given the responsibility to do priestly work, acting and speaking on God's behalf. And therefore, we will live as sent people going and naming Jesus in dark places where he is desperately needed. Because, we, because of our mission, we must ensure that our circumstances, feelings, fears, and insecurities do not hinder it. Do not hinder it. Because remember, Paul's in prison and he's praying for opportunity to share the mysteries of Christ, to declare them actually. And think about it. Think about who he's with. He wants to share the gospel with his enemies, the people who put him in prison. And then he wants to share the gospel with people who are far from God, the prisoners. And so this is a mindset shift that Paul sees everything as an opportunity to highlight Jesus. Paul is taking advantage of his time in prison to reach people he could not get to otherwise. This is a James 1 type of mindset, to count it all joy when you meet trials of various kind, for the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and less steadfastness produced in you. And if you lack wisdom, let him ask God. And I believe that Paul is just showing us this type of mindset, that he's counted it all joy, that he can see that this is an opportunity. And so my question for you, are you taking advantage of the situation you're in at work with your friends, with your family? Do you understand that you have been placed where you are for a reason, for a purpose, that you have been placed in your family for a purpose, in your friend group, in your field of study, in your jobs, at your school, on your team, that you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, Matthew 5, that we are the the salt and the light in those places. So you're the salt and light in your workplace. You're the salt and light in your family. You're the salt and light in your teams, in your friendships, in your schools, and online. That you are the salt and light. And guess what happens? If you're not the salt and light, who's going to be the salt and light in your family, in your school, online? Like if you're not doing that, who's going to do it? Remember the bystander effect? You actually think other people are going to do it? But that's just not the truth. And that's why we need to pray for opportunities to share the hope that we have. And you might be the only Christians that they know or might meet. Some of my friends from my past, they're not coming to my church. 
It doesn't matter how many times I invite them. It doesn't even matter if I'm speaking. They're just not going to walk into the doors of a church, but they'll go to my living room. They'll meet me at my table. They'll meet me for lunch. Just because somebody doesn't come to church doesn't mean that they can't hear the gospel. When we leave church, we are on a mission to go share the gospel with every single person we know. And so we have to pray for opportunities. And so this actually really convicted me that while Paul's in prison, he's asking for prayers for opportunity. And the reason it convicted me is if God answered Paul's prayers, people would hear the gospel. Like if Paul got his prayers answered, he would get opportunity to hear, for people to hear the gospel. And then I started thinking, what would be the result of my prayers? What would happen if God answered my prayers? What would change? What if God answered all of my prayers? Would people get an opportunity to hear the gospel? Would the kingdom of God advance if God answered my prayers? Would anything change? Would poverty, hunger, and homelessness end because of my prayers? Would corruption and war and conflict end because of my prayers? Would racism, discrimination, crime, human trafficking, and violence end because of my prayers? Would the world change at all? Let's make it more personal. Would your friends' depressing thoughts go away? Would your family be better off because of your prayers? What about your coworkers? Were they life changed? Would anyone come to know Jesus because you've been praying for them and God answered them? What if God answered all of your prayers this morning? What would change? And so personally, it's convicted me to be bold in my prayers. I'm going to pray like God is going to answer them. So I'm going to be bold when I pray for the world, our country, my church, my friends, and my family. Because I hope that if God answered my prayers, the world would change. The world would change. And so, for example, I had a friend of mine who I was literally sent down probably uh, almost a year and a half ago. We went... Um, I met him for the first time in our church lobby. He came up to me. He wanted to be part of Young Adults, and I usually get lunch with, with the guys. And so I went to go, and he was telling me his story. We were at Cheeseburger Bobby's, and he's just talking to me about he used to be addicted, and he used to he had like a lot of troubles, hit rock bottom, went to a rehab facility, all these things. And he was telling me how bad his life was. And then he said this one thing, man, it rocked me. And I, I mean, I could tell you like where he was seated and the way he said it, he said, all this happened, but I could not outrun my mother's prayers. And it just hit me that he was in front of me because God answered his mother's prayers to bring her son back home. That God said yes to his mom. And so now he serves on our church team He's literally serving uh, as an intern. He's serving young adults and leading in different ways. And, and the reason I bring that up is because our prayers matter. Our prayers matter. And so I pray that we are people who pray for our friends, for our family, and for our world. And I pray that they cannot outrun our prayers. And so I hope this encourages somebody. Just keep praying. Keep praying. And I feel like I could end the sermon there, but Paul's not done, so we have a little bit more, so don't get mad at me. So along with prayer, in uh, uh, verse 5, he says, Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of your time, and let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So along with prayer, how we live matter. And Paul's instructing us to do two things. He says, first, Walk in wisdom towards outsiders. So walk. The pace of your life matters. The pace of your life matters. You are running so fast that nobody can witness you following Jesus. That you have so much on your schedule, you have no time to stop. And so you have to understand, live at a pace that others can be around you to witness how you follow Jesus. And then Paul says, in wisdom, wisdom is knowledge applied. Everyone is watching. And your life speaks louder than your words. Benjamin Franklin said it like this, well done is better than well said. And then Jesus said that they'll know you by your fruit. They'll know you by your fruit. Paul continues, he says, walk in wisdom towards 
others. You are walking towards them, not away from them. Jesus walked towards you. And so we need to walk towards people because you're on a mission. And so how do you do this? You do this with love, humility, hospitality, and persistence. Persistence. I had a buddy of mine who who was having a rough time when we were in college. And one of my mentors, he had this Bible study on Sunday at six o'clock. And my mentor would text him every Sunday around one to two o'clock and just remind him, hey, we got Bible study on Sunday. You know how many times he texts him? He texts him for a year and a half before he showed up. And then he asked him, I asked him, hey, why'd you show up? He said, Sean kept texting me. Sean kept texting me. So we walk towards people with love, humility, hospitality, and persistence. Another thing he says, outsiders, people who do not know Jesus, people who are far from God, people who do not have access to the gospel. That means that we go to the nations and also our neighbors, that you go across the street and across the world. He continues, it says, make the best use of our time because our time is limited. The devil wants you to waste time and God wants you to invest your time because we have a choice on how we use our time. So do not waste it. The bad news is time flies. The good news is you're the pilot. Stephen Covey put it like this. The key is not spending time, but investing it. So invest your time in the kingdom of God. He also said that the key is not to prioritize what's on your schedule, but to schedule your priorities. Make God's mission a priority. And the last thing he says is speak life. Let your speech always be gracious, grace-filled, seasoned with salt, so that you know how you ought to answer each person. And so I'll close with this little story. It was this father who overheard his sons arguing, and his older son was being really rude and really mean to the younger son. And so the father that teaches the older son a lesson, he pulls him aside and he tells him, hey, I need you to get everything on this list and we're going to go on a trip tomorrow. And so the older son is like, yeah, I'm spending time with my dad. I'm super excited. He gathers everything on the list. He then gets his bag ready. They wake up early and they go on this hike. They reach the top of this mountain and the dad asks the son, hey, did you bring everything I asked you? And the, the son's excited. Absolutely, dad, here you go. And it was a book bag filled with feathers. And his dad looked at him. He says, okay, son, this is what I need you to do. I need you to take the feathers and I need you to throw them off the mountain as hard as you can. I need you to throw them. And the son does exactly what the dad asks. And after he's done, the son comes back to the dad. He says, hey, dad, all done. Here you go. I did everything you you asked me to do. And he says, okay, now, hey, go get the feathers back. And the son's looking at the dad and he's like, there's no way. What do you mean? I can't, I can get some, but I can't get all. They're gone. I threw them off the mountain. And he says, no, I need you to go get them back. Go get them and put them back in the bag. And the son says, dad, that's just impossible. There's no way I can do that. And he says, I know, son. I need you to understand that's exactly what happens when a word leaves your mouth. That when you use your word so sharply, you can't get them back. And so you need to be careful how you use your words. And so for us as Christians, we need to speak life because we don't get our words back. And so this is the best advice I've ever gotten about conversations. Win the person and not the conversation. Win the person and not the conversation. And so in closing, this is what I would like to do. I'll just take us to take time to pray because we talked about a lot. So if you would, if you could bow your heads and I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions and I just want you to pray whatever God tugs at your heart and do whatever he asks you to do. And so if you need to cultivate a prayer life, I want you to ask God to help you in your prayer life. That if you, he needs to spark a fire in you to talk to him, to spend time with him. Just start there. Maybe God needs you to be more watchful, to to see the need around you so that you can pray for people. Ask God to help you see the need. Maybe you need to become more thankful. Ask God to renew your heart and your mind and to remind you of the gospel. Maybe you just need to know the gospel. Need to spend time in God's word. Ask God to, to give you a hunger and a thirst for the word of God. Maybe you need help praying for the world that you get so angry when you see things on the news and on social media, that instead of commenting or or sending it to somebody else, that you begin to pray for that person. Or maybe you just need to be more attentive in your prayers.